we have a number of sayings that indicate that Jesus is willing to associate with persons who, who have some level of disrepute. So tax collectors or toll collectors. Jesus says, you know, to whom shall I compare this generation? We piped and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking. And you said he's demon possessed. That suggests that Jesus associated with persons of that particular group. Ignatius describes a Christ group using the terms that belong to Dionysiac associations. Christ bearers, Christophoroi, and you are Neophoroi, temple bearers. And he uses a whole series of words that, be, that end with this suffix foros or foroi, uh, a, a bearer. That's typical vocabulary of Dionysiac associations. The tendency of the genre is to seek a name. John the Baptist or Jesus and John the Baptist eventually got attached to these. No one really knew who they came from, but they sort of seek a, an author or seek a speaker. Uh, uh, that's, that's possible. And uh, as I say, one might propose even the same thing for the collection, the Aesop collection, that there's a series of sort of wise sayings and uh, at some point in the transmission of those sayings, somebody decides we really need a speaker for this and let's invent this character called Aesop. The kind of famous saying that doesn't go back to, histor to the historical Jesus, at least in the form that we have it, is John 3, unless a person is born anothen, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A pun that's available only in Greek, not in Aramaic would suggest to me that at least in this form, Jesus didn't say that. Today, my guest is a heavy hitter, Professor John Kloppenborg from Toronto University, is a specialist in Christian origins and Second Temple Judaism, in particular, the Jesus tradition, the canonical and non-canonical gospels, in the social world of the early Jesus movement in Jewish Palestine and in the cities of the Eastern Empire. He has written extensively on the Synoptic Sayings Gospel known as Q and the Synoptic Problem and is currently writing on the parables of Jesus, the letter of James, and cultic, professional, and ethnic associations in the Greco-Roman world. He is one of the general editors of the International Q Project and holds a five-year SSHRC Insight Grant on associative practices in the Greco-Roman world. In the ancient world, there's a process that has to be done for scribes to write things down and to pass them down and to copy these texts. Most of this work was done in a library. Very rarely is this stuff just written down randomly in the wilderness somewhere. These texts that we have for these Gospels have a lot of source material in common. And there are several hypotheses that are leading in academia right now. One of them is Mark and Priority, which is that Mark came first and the other Gospels borrowed from Mark. If that is to be accepted, it does lead a problem of how to explain the extensive material. Some 200 verses shared between Matthew and Luke, but not found in Mark at all. One way around this is Q which is the German word quell, which means sources. One of the remarkable things about this source material is that it's mostly sayings, quotes, proverbs, and words attested that are ascribed to Jesus. In the ancient world, this was a common thing. Socrates, another person who hasn't wrote anything down, who has sayings ascribed to him, and then stories written with those sayings later on. It fits the bill. So today we're going to talk about that. What is in this Q document? And what's the likelihood that a man named Jesus of Nazareth actually said these things? We're also talking about the earliest Christian groups known as Ecclesia, or sometimes translated as church, but also association groups. We go deep in this video. We talk about the earliest Christian groups and how it relates to the Greco-Roman world at the time period. And also, did Jesus exist and did he say these things? Stay tuned. 
Professor Kloppenborg, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for the well, invitation. Absolutely. It's I, I'm so happy to have you here. And uh, I think your book, uh, Christ Associations, is one of it's it's a it's a must read for people who are really trying to learn about early Christianity and its development. And uh it, it and it, also I think you really did officially redefine that 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 term ecclesia. I think it's that's a redefined word now. Whereas before you, this this just was church, and now yeah. we're looking at this word and saying this might have some different meanings. In fact, let's start off with this: the term ecclesia. It's often translated as church. In your research, we can say about the use of ecclesia in early centuries of Christianity. And what was the overall function of Christ's assemblies in the Roman Empire? Uh, my reason in Christ's association for offering somewhat different translations of uh, a number of terms, including ecclesia, was that, uh, in my view at least, uh, when we adopt terms like church or grace or bishop uh, to talk about early Christ groups, it immediately orients the reader to a certain, what I'll call a linguistic register, namely of a, a, a sort of a Christian church register and separates the reader from the, the linguistic registers that the ancient reader would have had. So uh, ecclesia is a perfectly normal term in Greek and it means assembly, synagogue, uh, similarly means assembly. So uh, if we as scholars uh, adopt uh, the, you know, the translation church, uh, it in a way blocks from your imagination or blocks from your, for, from your purview, uh, the normal sense that those were, that that word had, or those words had. Similarly with synagogue, synagogue, if it's translated as synagogue, one immediately thinks, ah, this really pertains only to, to uh, Jews. Right. Uh, and it's about particular practices that exist in the history of Judaism. The term is actually a normal term that means an assembly, a group of people who meet together for all sorts of different reasons. And uh, I've made a similar kind of argument um, in the translation of a term like charis, which gets translated in Bibles and a lot of Christian discourse as grace. Now, grace is a term that really only has some salience um, or intelligibility within pr uh, Christian theological circles. We we don't we don't any longer uh, use the term grace in uh, in normal discourse as we might have at the time of Shakespeare. But so it's a churchy word, and it immediately orients the the person, the reader or the user, to a kind of church environment. Well, charis is a normal term in Greek that means gift or, um, or, or what you do when you reciprocate the reception, uh, the, the, re the reception of a gift. So I've tried to be careful in using uh, what I would call normal, transla uh, normal translations of Greek words rather than churchy translations. And that actually changes the way in which you think about um, uh, about all sorts of uh, uh, stuff in the in the first couple of centuries, if if you call them Christ assemblies, that immediately um, at least creates the possibility for serious comparison with other kinds of assemblies, um, occupational guilds, uh, assemblies of diasporic people, Thracians who live in Athens, or or, or Judeans who live in in Asia Minor. These were all called assemblies. Wow. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in the governance of Greek cities, their town council was called an ecclesia. Um, so the ecclesia of the Athenians is the citizen assembly of Athenian males that made decisions. Similarly, the ecclesia of Thessaloniki was uh, an assembly of uh, probably Thessalonian males who um, uh, who participated in in the governance of the city? So when when you when you translate 
th uh, these Greek terms by what I would call their normal translations, it creates the possibility for you as an interpreter to to start to make connections, not necessarily, you're not necessarily arguing that uh, Christians borrowed these terms uh, from, uh, from other associations, but they used a term which would have automatically for the, the Greek speaker allowed for connections to both private associations that called themselves synagogue or ecclesia uh, and citizen assemblies that called themselves that same term. So that's kind of the methodological point in, uh, in deliberately using those terms. Um, and the point of the book or the, the large, yeah, the, the main point of the book is to engage in what I call heuristic comparison. That is to look at Christ groups um, and uh, to put them at least provisionally in the context of other kinds of associations, cultic associations, occupational guilds, uh, diasporic uh, uh, assemblies, uh, neighborhood clubs, and so forth. And to ask if we, do, if we, if we set Christ groups in that context, do we see something about Christ groups that we wouldn't have necessarily noticed uh, if we if we kind of hive them off as a special category and call them churches? As soon as you call them a church, then it's harder, much harder to compare them to anything else. So that's that's kind of, that's the point in uh, uh, in engaging in that kind of uh, comparison. That is very interesting. And is there? Do we see any other groups that call themselves assembly that are devotees of any other deities that we know of? There's a very, very small number of groups that call themselves ecclesiae. Um, uh, it's only, uh, you know, uh, four or five that we know that actually used that as a name. Um, the the we, we have more groups that called themselves synagogue including a, a professional association or an occupational guild of barbers that they call themselves the synagogue of barbers um which would just mean the barbers the the, the 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 barbers local association we know that there's a synagogue of synagogue of zeus uh evidently devotees of uh of zeus is that the uh, one in Pergamon? Just, just, just out of curiosity, just popped in my head. Yeah, you... from Pergamon, I think. Yeah. Oh, um, so, so that's probably what they're referring to in Revelation. Then it could, it could well be. It could well be. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and uh, but associations had a whole wide variety of terms uh, uh, by which to call them uh, call themselves. In Latin, they would be called a collegium or a coetus. Uh, or, or simply cultores, simply the worshippers of X, of Daddy X, and in Greek there was a similarly a wide variety of terms uh, that groups used. Sometimes uh, uh, theazos, uh, which we would just translate as I think a private association, or sometimes they named themselves after the deity. So the Serapiastai are the devotees of Serapis. And Christians eventually name themselves after Christ. They call they're called the Christianoi. Um, uh, so in that sense, Christians, Christ groups uh, adopt some of the same naming practices that uh, that uh, pagan associations of various sorts all, uh, also used. Which makes sense. I mean, it's kind of like a default way of doing. Yeah. Certain yeah. Certain things. Yeah. Interesting. Very very fascinating. I. I I think this is really amazing uh, material so i want to switch over the gears a little bit because you do a lot of work on q and um what is the process people want to know how do they because a lot of people are looking at q and just like where where are they getting this from yeah, where, where does this come from yeah well so what's the process for scholars and how do they decide on what on the q sayings are okay so um Q is a hypothetical document. Uh, that is, we don't have a, a papyrus copy of it, um, but it's uh, it can be reconstructed or it is reconstructed from uh, what you can think of as the two successor documents that used it. Uh, that is Matthew, uh, 
and Luke, and at least on the on the two document hypothesis, which is the still by far the uh, the most common way of thinking about the literary relationships among the of the three gospels. Um, Mark is the earliest and uh, the source, the literary source that Matthew and Luke used in order to to construct their gospels. But Matthew and Luke very clearly had uh, a document that uh, is not Mark, because Mark does not contain most of the stuff that Matthew and Luke share. Um, and that document, because we don't we don't actually know how it called itself. We call it Q, which simply means uh, that is a, the initial for the German word Quelle, source. Um, so uh, the way I I, I kind of explain uh, explain this to my students is that uh, you can think of Matthew and Luke's literary composition uh, on the analogy of uh, uh, two different authors who had let's say, uh, a narrative biography of Socrates, and they had a collection of sayings of Socrates. And Matthew and Luke, uh, or these two hypothetical editors then, were decided that they were going to combine those two sources, a narrative of Socrates and his sayings into a more comprehensive biography. And they did that. Um, so that's essentially what Matthew and Luke are doing. They've got two sort literary sources they've got the gospel of mark and they've got uh they've got this other document which is principally sayings of jesus and they combine them interestingly they combine them in different ways so matthew's choices in combining um uh these two documents are different from luke's choices um uh matthew has a stronger tendency to conflate sayings that is take a cue saying and join it to a Markan context, whereas Luke has more the tendency to to edit a chunk of Mark for a while and then switch to a, a chunk of Q. And so you get, it's called, we call it chunking, uh, you know, uh, uh, several paragraphs of Mark and then ser several paragraphs of Q and then back to Mark and then back, back to Q and so forth. So, um, whereas Matthew is, uh, more uh, is more of a kind of micro conflator who takes a, a particular saying of Q and sticks it into in the middle of a mark and saying. Uh, so they, but the the general point is they actually treat their two sources differently. They combine their two different sources um, differently. Now that makes it that poses a challenge for us in in reconstructing this second source. We've got Mark, and so you can look at how. Matthew edited Mark, and you can look how Luke edited Mark. Uh, and then you can look at the the materials that Matthew and Luke have in common that they didn't get from Mark. Um, so, for example, the Beatitudes uh, in, in uh, Matthew uh, 5 and in Luke 6. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there between Matthew and Luke, and we uh, hypothesize that that overlap is due to their common use of uh, of this uh, Q document. Now, um, since Matthew, si since we can look at how Matthew edits Mark, you can get an idea of what kinds of things he's likely to do. So, a simple example is that in talking about the the kingdom, Mark uses the term kingdom of God, and Matthew. Uh, tends to convert this to kingdom of the heavens. Um, heavens being a, a kind of pious circumlocution of the name God. Um, so when you see Matthew repetitively doing this, and then you see in a Q context where Matthew has kingdom of the heavens and Luke has kingdom of God, we would assume that probably what's happened is that Matthew has also uh, taken a Q saying which had kingdom of God and did what he normally does with Mark as well, and convert that to, uh, to kingdom of the heaven. So, in other words, uh, you use um, the comparison of Matthew's treatment of Mark and Luke's, tre Luke's treatment of Mark as a way of uh, arriving at a set of, uh, let's call them editorial policies that both writers have. And so when you see 
one of those editorial policies showing up in uh, the Matthew Luke material, then you can say, well, that's perhaps uh, Luke doing the changing or Matthew doing the changing. But uh, the the procedure itself, uh, I don't know if this is going to come off uh, if I show it to you. Uh, yeah, so this is the critical edition of Q. Uh, let me see. There we are. Uh, so what what the critical edition of Q does is it uh, uh, it offers uh, some columns uh, uh, that allow us to compare closely uh, Matthew and Luke's reading, and we've also added the Gospel of Thomas, uh, where there's a Thomas parallel. Oh, and wow. so you you can read across the page. There's a Markin column as well. So you have Matthew, uh, you have uh, Matthew, Luke, um, uh, Mark, and uh, and Thomas. The Markin column is usually empty because there's no Markin saying at all. Uh, but uh, so you can compare Luke's wording, Matthew's wording, and if you've got Thomas or something else that's a parallel, you can uh, compare them. And uh, using the principles that I just identified, that is, uh, when we know something about Matthew's tendency as an editor and Luke's tendencies of an editor, you can use that to uh, arrive at what we think is is the closer to the source that the that both of them are using um, so this then amounts to about four thousand words of text uh that matthew and luke uh share uh and the international q project that produced this uh, enormous book uh of wow. 500 pages or something like that wow. uh, uh, it basically simply is a tool it offers um uh, it, it offers a tool for uh, people to use, a tool that allows them to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, Thomas, and anything else that seems parallel. And uh, uh, and then you can see at the bottom of the page what the International Q Project has proposed as the reconstruction of Q um, uh, in Greek, and then there's an English, German, and French translation of it as well. Uh, uh, so it gives it gives the reader an idea of uh, what the IQP has thought probably is uh, the more likely reading uh, of Q. And as I say, this then amounts to uh, about 4,000 words of text, or if you convert this into verses, something like 230 biblical verses. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so the, and uh, we also make decisions about the relative sequencing of Q because sometimes Matthew and Luke disagree in the order in which they report Q sayings. And um, we have to take into account the same kind of editorial procedures. Matthew tends to be much more likely to move Mark and Pericope around uh, than Luke does. And uh, that perhaps suggests that Matthew is more likely to move to uh, sorry, sorry that that Matthew is more likely to move Mark and Pericope around, uh, that is relocate them sequentially, for his own purposes than Luke is. Luke tends to take Mark in the order he finds it, and uh, uh, we suggest again that uh, likewise Matthew is is more likely to move Q stuff around uh, sequentially, and Luke more likely simply to take it in the order in which he sees it. Um, so that allows us to come up with at least, at least a kind of provisional sequencing of uh, Q, Q sayings. Now, this wasn't in the questions list, but I just thought of it. When, when does, because Thomas is kind of a sayings document in its own right. Yes. When does that come along? And is that is that a later text or is this around the same time? That's really hard to know. Um, the uh, the, the advantage we have with uh, Q is that it has to be earlier than Matthew and Luke because they both use it. Now, dating Matthew and Luke is, is itself not an easy job. Matthew is usually dated sometime in the in the the eighties or the nineties, and Luke now uh, in the early one tens or something like that. So Q has to be earlier than those two. Uh, the the difficulty with Thomas is that uh, there's no 
there, there's really no datable historical references in Thomas that allow you to say, this has to have been written after the destruction of the temple, or it has to have been written after such and such a date. There's no historical references in it at all. So it leaves it uh, rather questionable. The earliest manuscript that we have of Thomas is about the end of the second century, but that's actually no different than our earliest manuscripts of Matthew, also at the early uh, end of the, uh, the, of the second century. Um, so uh, the first, the earliest attestation doesn't really help you date it any sure. more than it does uh, with, uh, 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 with Matthew and, and Luke. Um, they, so the datings, I mean, scholars have, have usually said for Thomas sometime in the second century. That's a, that book, that's a hundred years, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's pretty vague. And we've had a, there's a few colleagues, John, John Dominic Crossan and others who have suggested that Thomas is much earlier than that, sometime maybe as early as 60. Um, it's, it's really difficult to come up with a very convincing uh, date for Thomas, because as I say, it, does, it doesn't have any pegs that allow you to hook it to a datable, uh, datable event. Um, you know, all that we can say is that it's before the third century, because that's when we first start getting manuscripts of it. Um, and the, f the full Coptic version is uh, from Nag Hammadi, and the latest possible date for that is 348, because that's the dating of the, the, the uh, kind of junk papyri that have been used in um, the Nag Hammadi codices to produce to, to produce the uh, the covers. So you pull apart what's called the cartonnage, and you look at look at the junk papyri in there. And some of those have dates, and the latest date is in the middle of the fourth century. So obviously, the the Coptic version is produced sometime before the early fourth century, but that gives us an enormous scope, right? Right. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other issue that comes up with the Gospel of Thomas is, does it know the Synoptic Gospels? If, if for example, you could show that the Gospel of Thomas knows Luke um, or knows Matthew, then you would have a, uh, an earliest possible date for its composition. But, and that debate has sort of gone back and forth. Um, uh, I think uh, I, I'm one of those people who think that there's at least some sayings in the Gospel of Thomas that show no dependence at all on the Synoptic Gospels, right. which means that potentially, say, the parable of the tenants, uh, which is Thomas 65, uh, could be as early as Mark uh, uh, as, a, as a saying. Now, when it actually got incorporated into a text called the Gospel of Thomas, that's really unknowable, I think, uh, except, you know, sometime in the second century or perhaps a bit earlier. So that's a, you know, that's not a very satisfying answer. But I think given the nature of the data that we have, that's about all that can be said responsibly. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the questions I'm, you know, running into with people that, that I think is, are good questions is like, we date Paul before these gospels and you know some people say 40s some people say 50s and 60s mm -hmm. but he's writing the churches that are in macedonia he's writing the churches that are in anatolia and so there already is a network of these um associations yes and and the question is like what are they reading are they do they are this just oral are they what do they know about jesus what do they believe about it's like we Paul doesn't give us that much. He just sort of is well. It, it comes off as like a real letter, actually, because it makes you re makes me think that it's a real letter because it's just so like random on some places that you yeah, have absolutely. And in fact, you know, the Paul never mentions the miracles of Jesus. Does that mean that he he doesn't know them, or that he doesn't use them as illustrations, uh, or that uh, does it mean that say those in Corinth or those in uh, in uh, Thessaloniki or other towns, they also don't know that Jesus is a miracle worker. That see, if he doesn't say anything, then it's very difficult to to be certain about either what he knows or what 
his correspondents know as kind of common knowledge. He's, I mean, as you indicated just at the beginning, of course, Paul is not going to repeat information that he already knows that his recipients know. You don't do that in yeah, a letter. That's exactly. But that leaves us with a real problem. Uh, he does cite a few sayings of Jesus, uh, and he attributes them to Jesus. So the, the saying on divorce uh, is attributed uh, he says he's got this from the Lord. Now, that's a saying that shows up both in Mark and in Q, the prohibi uh, prohibition of marriage after divorce. Um, uh, and uh, he's also got uh, this saying about the the servant uh, or of the minister of the gospel being worthy of his hire. Um, that's in 1 Corinthians. And he's got also the words of institutions. Um, uh, for the Last Supper, which doesn't occur in Q as far as we know, but that's, it certainly occurs in Mark. That's a big one. That's a big yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now does that's, he's, you know, Mark is already too late for him to know it, but he, uh, he evidently knows some of those sayings, probably orally, uh, from oral tradition. So I suppose that, that, uh, that Paul has some uh, idea of things that Jesus said, and he very occasionally cites them. I mean, it's really interesting how seldom he cites Jesus. If I mean, if, if this was, if he knew the whole contents of Q or the tradition that ultimately goes into Luke or Matthew, it's kind of curious that he just doesn't, he doesn't ever cite it, even when it might have been useful for him to cite it. Um, and as I say, there's no, there's no evidence of, uh, he doesn't appeal to miracles. He talks about his own miracles or his own mighty uh, acts, but but never says, oh, Jesus did these things too, or I'm doing this, the things that Jesus did. And we don't get any of that. So uh, that leaves us questioning about whether he knows much about that tradition. And of course, he's not a direct disciple of Jesus. He's, he's uh, He already belongs to the kind of second tier. Right. And that's where, and that's where this, mystery lies is like we don't have gospels yet but we do have a network of yes assemblies groups yeah so it's like what are they believing what are they thinking about and i think a lot of times i've run into this piece of the puzzle that i think people aren't talking about is there's these hypsisterians mm -hmm. greek monotheists and i wonder if it, that network was already there and then someone like jesus comes along it, but then once you start thinking about that, you're like, well, then why isn't, why are we waiting so long till Josephus and Tacitus to even hear about him in any of the sources? It's just a, it's, it's a mystery. It is. Yes. The, this, these groups of uh, devotees of Theos Hypsistas are really quite interesting. They, we find them mostly in, uh, in Thrace, in Macedonia, uh, some in Asia Minor and a few in uh, in Greece. There's a couple that show up in other parts, but <clears throat> especially around the north shore of the of the Black Sea, there's lots and lots of them. We've got I've got a, a doctoral student who's working among other things on hips, on Theos Hypsistos groups, um, and uh, the uh, this is one of these uh, interesting examples where. We know that there are many groups. We know their names. We know we've got membership lists. We know who belong to them. Uh, but we don't know much about what they believed. Uh, I mean, it would be nice to have a document like a gospel from one of these groups that told us exactly what they, you know, what they think Theos Hypsisos is about. Uh, th that said, though, there's still some really interesting uh, features of, about these Hypsisterian groups. Uh, they tend uh, not to uh, offer iconic representations of the deity. Sometimes all that's indicated is an eagle um, uh, or a star on their on their um, uh, on their inscription. So rather than actually giving us a picture of what Theosipsistos is like, uh, we get an iconic representations uh, that has invited. Um, for some scholars think that there may be some kind of connection with Jewish groups because of course the Septuagint calls God among other things Hypsistos the most high um now I I I'm I don't think that there's enough of the connections between the Theos Hypsistos uh 
inscriptions that we have and Jewish inscriptions to say it's the same, uh, or even that one has influenced the other. Hypsistos is simply a nice epithet that is the most high um, uh, or the best. And there's certainly a tendency in the Hellenistic period when you name your God to attach a superlative to it. So um, Jupiter is called Optimus, that is the best, the biggest and the best. And uh, we have other groups that use similar superlatives, uh, including words like Hypsistos to describe their deity. So I don't think the fact that the Hypsistarians and Jews use the same term necessarily creates a connection. However, it really is, it's quite interesting that many of the Hypsisterian inscriptions do not seem to have been produced in professional uh, workshops. Uh, they're they're more of the line of a uh, of a of an inscription that is cut by someone who basically is literate but doesn't really know the techniques of how you produce a beautiful calligraphic uh, kind of inscription. So that suggests uh, groups that are lower on the economic scale. They also tend to be gender inclusive uh, and inclusive of uh, uh, of persons of uh, of a variety of uh, social ranks or social social registers. There's a very interesting inscription from Veroea. It's uh, in uh, northern Greece, where uh, a number of the members of this group are identified as artisans, um, nail makers, and things like that. And there's others who probably are slaves. And uh, there's at least two who are Roman citizens. Uh, that's That kind of complexion of a group starts to look uh, a little bit like what we would imagine, say the Corinthian group uh, to consist of. Some persons who perhaps have Roman citizenship, others who are artisans, they're certainly slaves in the Corinthian group. Um, so what's, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that there's a genetic relationship uh, between hypsisterian groups and uh, Christ groups, but uh, there's some interesting parallels uh, that uh, might suggest that these groups might, in some ways, have looked the same yeah. uh, in terms of their uh, their complexion. But as I said at the beginning, it would be really nice to know what the hypsisterians actually believed, what kind of rituals they engaged in, and we don't know. It. We don't know much about that at all. I'm wondering if you're familiar with these this Roman inscription from 139 BCE about the Jews getting kicked out of Rome for for attempting to infect. I'm reading a Wikipedia right now. Ref, infect the Roman custom with the cult of Jupiter Sabatios. Yeah, Sabatios. Yeah. And, See, and I, the reason why I bring that up is because in Phrygia, this god is really popular. This is yeah. also where you see these Theos Hypsistos groups at located as well as do you think is it possible that there might this might be there might be something going on here or is this just not enough to know the, that's another one of these cases where there's not enough to know there is a cult of sabatios and uh you know the the word it's the name itself with the sab beginning <laughs> right. has you know suggested that does this have something to do with the shabbat right. uh, well that's that's a connection that it's very difficult to make in any kind of convincing way. Yeah, because nobody uh, nobody actually says it outright. There's nobody. No, saying, they don't. Uh, that would but help. it's also it's also a it's an easy confusion to make, uh, and it's not only an easy confusion for us, but you might imagine that ancient people also seeing Sabatios might have said, "Well, these are Jews." Good point. Because uh, um, uh, uh, the. Uh, I don't think that the cult of Sabatios is a Jewish cult, but the name certainly kind of invites uh, a comparison or a confusion or a conflation uh, of those uh, of those two. And but what you, you know what you're looking at there is um, uh, the the kind of xenophobia that one sees uh, exactly in Rome, uh, where foreign cults uh, enter Rome. And uh, there's a couple of them that were welcomed. The cult of the great mother was actually welcomed when she gets a temple on the Palatine Hill. Uh, but uh, ISIS has has uh, has some real trouble getting established in Rome. There's uh, deep suspicion about um, uh, about the cult of ISIS because of its Egyptian origins, 
especially at the time of the conflict between Octavian and um, and uh, Anthony Mark Anthony because I think they want they depicted themselves as Isis and Dionysus <laughs> yeah exactly right and uh, and Octavian later called Augustus for political reasons doesn't want to do that and right. so there's you know there's a problem with the reception of the cult of Isis but it later gets embraced uh, in Rome and we've got temples of Isis in Pompeii there's a nice temple of Isis so it it yeah. seems to have made its way in. Uh, so, uh, and Jews have the same pro the same kinds of problems. That is, they're uh, they're welcomed, but they run into difficulties from time to time. And exactly the same thing with uh, with Christians at the time uh, of, say, Pliny, or maybe even uh, 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 Domitian, and later they they anything that looks foreign that involves foreign looking deities and uh, and odd practices immediately comes under suspicion wow this is interesting stuff so um the next question that people are asking is if we establish that these q sayings are coming from a common source of a group of sayings that somebody said that begs the question does that mean jesus actually this proves he existed what are your thoughts on that? Well, if if all we had was Q, I'd say with the the answer would be, it, do, it certainly doesn't prove it. Uh, it doesn't exclude Jesus' existence, but uh, 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 you know we've got sayings of Aesop. Was Aesop a real person, or is this a fabricated uh, person? Uh, you know, a slave who has all this wisdom. Well, I I that you know. I don't know that anyone has ever tried to to make a strong argument that Aesop actually existed. Um, uh, you know, in in some sense, he becomes a name to which you attach sayings. Um, and was there a historical Aesop? Uh, and did he actually say anything? I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure how you'd make that argument. He is considered one of the seven sages of, is it Greece, I think, or Hellas? And... I think he's on a list with other people who are historical, but yeah, he, I mean, he's not traditionally one of the seven sages. That's uh, that's um, oh, okay. But but he gets added to that. That's what that's what I'm thinking. Of, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, so you know, I, as I say, if if all we had was Q, uh, I think we would be basically in the same situation as we were with Aesop and a number of other uh, other persons. Now with Q uh, or with with Jesus. Our sources uh, from uh, about Jesus come from multiple, we think, independent sources. So uh, Mark and Q, I think, are independent of one another. They both talk about Jesus. Uh, Paul, even though he doesn't say very much about Jesus' sayings, uh, there's no reason not to think that Jesus, that Paul thinks that Jesus was a real person. Um, uh, you know, he he puts a lot of stake in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the death certainly means that he was a real person. Uh, then we have the Gospel of Thomas, and we have we have a couple of other uh, sources as well. So when you get several independent sources, all of which belong to, let's say, the first century, talking about uh, a, a person, I think it's a relatively safe bet to think that that person uh, existed. An, an analogy to this would be uh, Socrates. We've we don't just have Plato's word for Socrates. We have uh, a negative portrait of Socrates in Aristophanes' The Clouds. And we've got Xenophon's Memorabilia, which is all about Socrates. So you've got three different uh, ancient reporters uh, who talk about Socrates as a real person. And I don't, I don't know that we have any classic scholars or scholars of ancient philosophy who doubt that Socrates existed. Now, that doesn't mean that the sayings that are attributed to Socrates are what Socrates said. So it's pretty clear that that Plato might have some Socratic sayings, but he's taken Socrates way beyond uh, what the historical Socrates probably said. Um, uh, Aristophanes makes fun of Socrates, um, so you get a kind of polemical representation of him. And Xenophon is more a follower who, who gives a you know uh, who gives a record of some of the things that Socrates said, but 
uh, with both Socrates and Jesus, we're in the we're in the situation of having multiple sources that don't always agree with one another, and one then has to do some filtering uh, to sort out which likely go back to the historical Socrates or the historical uh, Jesus. But as I say, uh, I, you know, I think our situation with so with Jesus is not very different from that with with Socrates. I think it's not a reasonable thing to doubt that Jesus existed given the the number of uh, ancient um, documents that take for granted that he exists. But that it's a very different question whether we actually know what we know about or what we think we know about what he said. That's a different matter entirely because you've got disagreements. Uh, yeah. Some serious disagreements. Yeah, that's a good point. But so would it make sense then for people to write sayings and then these sayings end up being in common throughout these sources if someone just made this all up somebody wrote some sayings that aren't really attributed to anybody in particular they're like a collection of sayings from different people over time and they put it into one place and then made it into a person and then those sayings got is that like which one do you think is more likely well i think both are both are po uh, both are probable the um the early work that I did on Q, which came out as the formation of Q, um, located, tried to locate Q in the context of ancient sayings collections, uh, and of which we got lots. Proverbs, uh, uh, Sirach are, are two of the Jewish collections, but we've got Anak Shashank and Amenomope from Egypt and uh, Mary Kare. We've got uh, a number of Babylonian collections. Uh, sentences of Aesop are the same. We've got a number of Greek and Latin collections, basically wise sayings attributed to uh, various wise persons. And uh, the wh what I noticed when I started working through this hundreds of collections is that they all, they typically all are connected to a person. Um, uh, that is, it seemed to be in the genre of sayings collections that you couldn't just have an anonymous collection of sayings. Uh, there was a very strong tendency to attach them to a name. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean that the name to which they're attached is a reliable name. Um, uh, I mean, we've got various versions of the sayings of the seven sages. They're different sayings, but they're all connected to the same sages. Now, uh, I think theoretically, you one might propose that there was an originally a set of uh, anonymous sayings, uh, wise sayings, and since the tendency of the genre is to seek a name, that uh, the name Jesus or the name John the Baptist or Jesus and John the Baptist eventually got attached to these because no one knew, no one really knew who they came from. But sayings have you know they sort of seek a, an author or seek a speaker. Uh, uh, that's that's possible, and uh, as I say, one might propose even the same thing for the collection, the Aesop collection. That there's a series of sort of wise sayings, and uh, at some point in the transmission of those sayings, somebody decides we really need a speaker for this, and let's invent this character called Aesop. Or maybe there is somebody named Aesop who, you know, it's just a name, and they they attach it. That, I think that's possible, but it's equally possible that um, that uh, that the collection of of sayings um, uh, preserve a memory, some kind of memory that Jesus actually said some of them, or and then the the collection gets gets created by the kind of accretion of other sayings to a core of of. Uh, of sayings that actually do go back to Jesus. I, I think an argument could be made in both directions, and uh, there's almost no way for us to decide which is the more probable. Good point. Yeah, good answer. Um, I just thought of this too. This is just an extra side thing, is that when you get people like Celsus in the second century who are hostile, they don't. you don't hear them ever saying, this didn't happen. It's always, in fact, you get traditions that are strange about his father being a roman soldier named pantera mm -hmm. yeah any thoughts on that before i go to the next question uh 
Yeah, that's right. It's uh, certainly Kelsis thinks that Jesus existed. Now he thinks he was a magician, thinks that he learned his craft. Uh, basically, he, he learned uh, the kind of deception that Egyptian that he thinks Egyptian magicians pr uh, typically practice. So he doesn't doubt that Jesus existed. He just he just uh, despises his uh, his credentials as somebody that's actually worth listening to. Uh, or, and certainly not worth revering as a as a deity or as a holy as a holy person. Yeah, it's fascinating to read that kind of stuff. Um, so, on a scale of one to ten, meaning, like, let's say that we decide that these sayings were written by somebody, and that person probably is Jesus. Put that aside for now. On a scale of one to ten, ten meaning Jesus probably said it, and a one meaning he probably didn't say it. Uh, which of these sayings are closest to 10? Do we have any a couple or one or two maybe that are, not, they don't have to be 10, but like which are the closest seven, six, whatever that is? Which are the highest on that ranking, on your opinion? Well, um, the there's a number of Q sayings that, that scholars uh, of all sorts uh, pretty routinely attribute to Jesus. Um, so the... Uh, the um, one of them would be uh, Q620, which is uh, blessed of the poor. Uh, now, I, I mentioned right at the beginning that there's there's a disagreement between Matthew and Luke in how they frame this. That is, Luke, uh, Luke says, uh, for yours is the kingdom of God, second person plural. And Matthew says, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, third person plural, using kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. But they at least agree agree on on uh, the the blessing of the poor. Now, the one of the reasons I think for attributing this uh, that Q saying to to the historical Jesus, and as I say, most reconstructions of the of the historical Jesus will include that one, uh, is be is because uh, uh, it's triply attested. It, it occurs in Q, which means it shows up in Matthew and Luke. Uh, but it's also Gospel of Thomas 54, and there's an echo of it in uh, in James 2.5. So this is a saying which, uh, at least in my view, can be probably attributed to the historical Jesus because it, sh it shows up in two or three different locations. The saying on divorce, prohibiting divorce, uh, in Q, this takes the form uh, uh, that um, uh, the man who divorces his wife and uh, uh, and marries another commits adultery against her. Uh, uh, that appears in Q uh, sixteen. It it occurs in Mark, and it's cited by Paul as a saying of Jesus in one Corinthians. So you've got three different, uh, I think, independent attestations of it. That for me. Uh, would constitute a reasonably good uh, ground for saying that probably does go back to the historical Jesus. Uh, sayings that are singly attested are uh, only in one source. It may be harder to, they may not be a number one on your scale, but they may, there may be still good reasons for attributing it to Jesus. But the ones that show up in, uh, in two or three independent historical sources I think have a better chance of uh, going back to Jesus than uh, uh, than uh, some other ones. So I would say that divorce saying the blessed are the poor. The uh, parable of the mustard seed is this is one that shows up in Q, in Mark, and in the Gospel of Thomas. Um, uh, so three different sources, uh, and there's you know there's a few others. Even you know the notion the saying that that appears in. Q11 about uh, seek and you will find for the one who seeks, finds, and so forth. We get um, uh, an echo of that in the beginning of the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, there's an echo of it in James. Uh, and it shows up in later uh, early Christian literature. Uh, that's actually, it's attested in about five or six different places, versions of that seek, find thing. Um, and so that would be that would be the place that I would start in in analyzing the Q sayings. I'd look for the ones that show multiple attestation that 
also appear in Mark or Thomas or uh, uh, echoes of it, say, in, in John or echoes of it in Paul or in James. Uh, those are the ones that I would say most probably go back to, uh, to the uh, uh, historical Jesus. The ones that I would say, uh, I think the, the kind of famous saying uh, that doesn't go back to, histor to the historical Jesus, at least in the form that we have it, is John 3, uh, 3 the, which is, uh, unless uh, a person is born anothen, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, that saying that we that we have in Mark th in John three, it depends for its rhetorical force on a pun that exists only in Greek. That is, wow. it's it's the word anothen. You know, if you read this this dialogue with Nicodemus, so Jesus says, I'm I'm just going to use the Greek word at the crucial point. Uh, you know, unless one is born anothen, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, anothen has a double meaning in Greek. It means either again or it means from above. And it's clear that John constructs this story, this dialogue. And Nicodemus, his response indicates that he thinks that anothen in this context means again. Because he says, for how is it possible for a man you know, who's fully mature to enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. Uh, and then Jesus, uh, then John uh, has Jesus rephrase the saying, uh, and he says, unless one is born from the spirit and water, one cannot uh, enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so at that point, it becomes clear that, that Nicodemus should have taken anothen to mean from above. And then the saying would have made sense. But the very fact that this, the the whole rhetorical effect of this saying plays on a pun that's available only in Greek, not in Aramaic, would suggest to me that at least in this form, Jesus didn't say that. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are sayings in, uh, in Mark and special sayings in Matthew and in Thomas, which suggest that there may be a precursor the saying about becoming a child and entering the kingdom of God, uh, that may be a kind of precursor of John's version uh, of this born again saying. Um, because the, you know, unless one uh, turns and becomes a child, one, one cannot uh, enter the kingdom. Uh, that is a saying that seems to suggest some kind of radical reorientation of the self. Um, in ways that are kind of normally impossible. Uh, and uh, that saying, as a, you know, because we've got versions of it in Thomas, we've got a version in Mark, and we've got a, a second version from another saying that Matthew records. That I think has a better chance of being historical Jesus. And then in that case, we would say, I think that John knows something of a saying like that, but he decides to frame it in a much punchier way using a pun that only works in Greek. And now it becomes rebirth rather than turning and becoming a, be like a little child or something like that. So I'd say John, you know, John 3.3, 3, not from the historical Jesus in the way it's been framed, but there may be something behind it uh, that is historical Jesus stuff. Do you, do you know of any areas in the Greek world where that pun is used at all? Um. I don't know offhand whether we've got other examples of the pun of that word functioning as a pun, but the we've got lots and lots of instances of the word in Greek being used sometimes to mean again and sometimes to mean from above. Uh, we got lots of examples of that. John, the the author of the Gospel of John, likes puns, uh, and he uses some uh, the the word hupsao to either to glorify or to lift up physically is uh, a, a pun that he uses. Now that's a pun that also works in Ara Aramaic, right? Um, uh, there's, Aram there's an Aramaic word that has both the sense of to lift up someone physically as on the cross and also to lift them up socially or in terms of reputation, that is to glorify them. So John, uh, there, there are puns in John that would work in Aramaic. 
the, the John 3.3 3 doesn't. Um, uh, it only works in Greek. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, is there any other examples like that that you think, yeah, he didn't say that? Um, well, uh, uh, one example would, would be, you know, we have, we have a number of sayings, uh, say from Q, that uh, indicate that Jesus is willing to associate with with disreputable with persons who who have some level of disrepute so tax collectors or toll collectors um, so we've got in in q uh, a, uh, uh, a saying uh, jesus says you know to whom shall i compare this generation that is his fellow jews uh, they're like children in the marketplace uh, who say uh, you know we uh, we piped and you didn't dance. We blew it. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and you said he's demon possessed. And the Son of Man, self-reference, came eating and drinking, and you said that he's a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors. Um, so that, and we've got a number of sayings in Mark that suggests that Jesus associated with persons uh, of that particular group. Now contrast that with uh, with Matthew eighteen, where he's this is a this is material that doesn't show up in other sources. Where Matthew is elaborating some disciplinary features of uh, of a Christ group. So if someone sins, you go to them privately and see if uh, if you can convince them to do otherwise. If that doesn't work, you take another person uh, and uh, and uh, encourage them. And if that doesn't work, then you treat them like a tax collector. So, I mean, I say to my, my students, what does that mean? Does that mean you have dinner with them? No, clearly. I mean, Matthew says, treat them like a tax collector. In other words, you throw them out. You do not associate with them. But that's in pretty interesting tension with this other stream of material that you find in, uh, in the uh, early phases of the Synoptic Gospel, which indicate Jesus does associate with tax collectors uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and, you know, isn't about to rebuke them or throw them out of his company. And uh, Matthew is even willing to imagine that one of Jesus' disciples, Matthew, is a tax, is a former tax collector. So I'd say the Matthew 18 use of uh, a Jesus, uh, the Matthew 18 Jesus saying, probably doesn't go back to uh, the historical Jesus at all. It reflects a somewhat later stage of the organization of Christ groups where it's important to decide who the pious are and who the impious are, and the impious you, ex you exclude. But this, I think, already belongs to a phase of, uh, you know, the development of organizational practices within Christ groups uh, where you have, to, you have to come up with disciplinary rules. Uh, many of these, uh, uh, many of the associations that I work on, similarly had disciplinary rules. So, um, being a disturbance at the at the group's banquet might be enough of a reason to get you expelled. Interesting. And then you, uh, are any yeah. evidence of early Christ assemblies having connections to assemblies and to pagan gods? Um, I guess it, it depends on on what we might mean by connection that Christ groups knew about other assemblies, uh, I think is pretty clear. If one thinks about <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, where Paul addresses the issue of whether uh, a Christ devotee should participate in a cultic meal where the, where the meal, where the meat is, has been sacrificed to a pagan deity. So this is the kind of activity that occurred in uh, in pagan temples, it also occurred in a number of pagan associations where uh, their meal uh, would have begun with a sacrifice of an animal uh, and the sacrifice then, you know, part of the sacrifice is offered to the deity and then the devotees eat the, the remainder of the sacrifice. So uh, I think it's entirely possible that in Corinth, Paul knows perfectly well that there are other groups devoted to other deities. Uh, 
and uh, cultic meals. And one of the issues that he addresses in 1 Corinthians 8 is, is it okay for Christ devotees to attend those um, and uh, uh, as they seem to have been doing? And his answer is try to, 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 to dissuade them from doing so. Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if one looks at the letters, uh, the letter of Ignatius, uh, to the Ephesians, this would be from the very early part of the second century. Uh, that, uh, Ignatius describes a Christ group using the terms that belong to Dionysiac associations. So he says uh, that you are uh, uh, Christ bearers, Christophoroi, and you are Naophoroi, temple bearers, and he uses a whole series of words that be, that end with this suffix foros or foroi, uh, a, a bearer. Yep. Now, that's that's typical vocabulary of Dionysiac associations where there are basket bearers. Phasmophoria. Are false... Phasmophoria. Exactly, exactly. So there are, bear, you know, and he's what he's describing is a kind of procession of Christian, a, a Christian pr a procession where each of these members has a different for us name or for us function a uh, they're a bearer of a christ or the temple or something like that and but that vocabulary comes straight out of uh, understanding what dionysiac how good dionysiac groups uh, divide their their uh, devotees into certain classes of basket bearers and phallus bearers and so forth so now that doesn't mean that uh, uh that I think that what I think that means that he knows perfectly well what that vocabulary is because he knows about Dionysiac groups and he sees them, he hears their vocabulary, and he adapts them. It surely doesn't member, mean that that his Christ believers are members of a Dionysiac group. They, for all we know, they could have been former members. And, That's let me and, let me run something by you real quick. As someone who's you're a professor, you're an expert. I'm just an amateur reading this stuff and f for fun. Let me run this by you and get your opinion. This is the last thing we'll talk about. Because I've recently had come up with a hypothesis that some of these early Christians are converts coming from Orphism. And the reason why I think that is for a couple of reasons. When we look at Clement of Alexandria, he really he's really like focusing on these Orphic uh, traditions and even saying like Christ is the new Orpheus singing the song of salvation. He says that in his... Uh, exhortation to the greeks you also have in some of these early catacombs pictures of jesus looking like orpheus mm -hmm. and uh the last thing i i've, I've yeah, with, a, with a sheep on his shoulders yes and so and then you have paul talking about listen guys you might have you might show up at a dinner and they might offer uh uh, uh they might give you meat so that was sacrificed to an idol it's all right just chill out chill out unless, unless it trips your brother up it trips your brother up then then don't do it and I'm thinking, where who are these people associating with? And th when I look at the Orphics, they are a lot similar in their piety and their religious devotion. It seems to me that th this this could be part of their early Christian transition. That these people were, for for whatever reason, more likely to convert to Christianity. What's your thoughts on that? That's that that's entirely possible. I'd I'd also point you know <clears throat> you know at <clears throat> the beginning of 1 Thessalonians says, uh, everybody's heard how you turned from idols to serve the true and living God. So Paul here is, I think he's citing what's common knowledge between him and the Thessalonians, namely that at some point they were not Christ devotees. They were devoted to other kinds of deities. He doesn't say which kind of deities there, but uh, Dionysus is a possibility, or, you know, Orphism is... Which is, which is big in Orphism. The Dionysus, yeah. the Thesmophoria, that's all Orphic stuff. And yeah. not, not to mention the Derveni papyrus is found right in the smack dab in the middle of Thessalonica. Yes, yeah. So it's entirely, th this is in, in, entirely possible. Um, uh, I think it was Bob Jewett that wrote a, in his book on, uh, on Thessaloniki, uh, argued that there was a connection to the cult of the Kabiroi, um, which was a, sort of a quasi-mystic, uh, cult uh, that's uh, that's that's possible um, 
the 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 difficulty that we have is Paul doesn't actually say very much about what groups they came from and doesn't give us much of a clue uh, about sure. uh, uh, what they had uh, what they had originated as as you know as uh, cultores of some other of some other deity but we do have examples uh, in antiquity of of persons converting from one deity to another. One of the famous examples of, is Elias Aristides, who is this famous hypochondriac uh, from the second century, where uh, in when we first uh, uh, tune into him and, and can read his, his material, he's very devoted to the, the Greco-Egyptian deity Serapis. He writes a hymn to Serapis and so forth. And, uh, but there's a point at which he decides, he seems to decide that Asclepius uh, is better for him. That both Serapis and Asclepius are healing gods, but Asclepius is also connected with rhetoric. And he's a rhetorician. And in the latter part of his career, he seems to be much more interested in, uh, in his devotion to Asclepius and not to Serapis anymore. So there's an example of somebody sort of switching deities. Uh, uh, one of my former students, Zeba Crook, has uh, written extensively on this notion of shifting from one deity to another. No, Nonus, I think. Nonus converts to Christianity, I think. Uh, he was, he wrote the Dionysica. I yes, but, yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, and then he writes this uh, this sort of allegorical poem uh, oh, about Christianity. So, yeah, you, you get people switching. That's a, it's a really interesting problem, a really interesting question, why? That is, what does the new deity have? What benefits does the new deity offer or the new group offer that the older deity didn't uh, offer? It's presumably there was some reason uh, for the conversion. It's either that one deity is has offered benefits that the other didn't have, or maybe the social group. That's what that, I'm that, That's what yeah, I'm Maybe there's more attraction uh, of that social group. There's something about the... There's the social glue that holds them together that's more appealing. You know what I think uh, is a good way to look at that is compare how people leave certain t Christian denominations to go to other denominations. Like yes. somebody might leave the Catholic Church because, whoa, these Baptists, they really have the real gospel and let's go over there. Or maybe the other way around. I mean, someone's like, yeah, these Baptists are a little too uh, a little too right wing for my taste. I'm going to go to this Catholic Church and, oh, look how nice this church looks. Oh, look at all these statues. Maybe those are some things that you can compare to in the ancient world, how people switch over, you know? Yeah, that's, th those kinds of comparisons are, are really useful. It's, uh, th there has been an interesting correlation between American evangelicals converting to Greek orthodoxy. And you would think, boy, that's not an intuitive change to make. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, it's observed all over the place that it happens. And one might then suggest that it's uh, there's a certain appeal to uh, the amount of ritual that you see in uh, in orthodoxy that you don't see, uh, you know, incense and uh, vestments and all of that may have its own attraction. Uh, another way, another kind of interesting comparison that Rodney Stark has made is to look at conversion uh, uh, by the Mormons, where the Mormons, uh, I, I think, one of the one of the motors behind Mormon conversion is the strength of Mormon groups or the strength of Mormon socialities that uh, you belong to a Mormon group and you're in a sense fixed for life uh, for social relations, strong and healthy social relationships. Uh, it may have nothing to do with theology. It may have to do with the, the kind of internal co cohesion of these Mormon groups and uh, especially for people who feel a little alienated or a little you know, disconnected from their own groups. A Mormon sure. group is a great one to belong to. Uh, though I, that conversion, I think, can happen both for kind of theological reasons and it can it can occur for entirely social reasons. That, uh, uh, you know, and Stark has also made the interesting point that <clears throat> in the in the third century, when the anti when the uh, plague of Cyprian hits, uh, both Christians and Jews cared not only for their own, but they cared for their pagan neighbors. And even though Christians 
would like some, some Christians would have likely succumbed to the plague, which was maybe smallpox or maybe even uh, bubonic plague. It's unclear. Uh, but uh, for pagans who had been cared for by Christians who recovered, uh, then the likelihood of conversion goes way up. You know, if someone has has saved your life through their care uh, and true. through their God. Uh, then that becomes a powerful incentive to take their God pretty seriously. So that may have been one of the motors, uh, Christian behavior and Jewish behavior for, uh, for conversion. Uh, Julian the Apostate is very unhappy that Christians did this, and he's even un more unhappy that pagan priests didn't do it. Uh, that is, they tended you know, to hightail it out of town when the plague hit, uh, rather than caring for anybody. Um, so you know that's that's conceivably also one of the motors for conversion well i really enjoyed this conversation and uh links for the books in the description anything else you want to say before we go no it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you for your time and you have attained true gnosis <laughs> you have just attained true gnosis the demiurge has no power over you Cheers.